I'm really happy to be here today talking about what I've come to think of as the new three R's. Remember the days when we were told the three R's were reading, writing, and arithmetic? And now we have rankings, ratings, and reputation as the three R's that we think about. So, um, and I'm going to talk about the experience we're having at UCLA where we are very much in the mix in working with faculty and other administrative and academic offices across the campus to really think about ratings and, um, and rankings. Uh, what I do want to start out with, though, is a, a true confession. Uh, when, when Ricky asked if I would be willing to speak on this subject, at that point, yes, I, I had seen ratings that listed UCLA, and I knew that UCLA was highly rated, but I'd never really gone to the campus website to take a look and see how the campus presented itself. So I, I did that, and of course, right away, I found that they have a whole section of their website <laughs> devoted to ratings. So you too can download a PDF that's seven pages long that has many different uh, listings of how UCLA stacks up in the various kinds of um, rankings that we've already discussed today. So uh, they start with US News and World Report because that's such an important one, generally speaking, uh, and show UCLA's rank there. Uh, and then the, they also talk about the global US News and World Report ranking, um, which is they use a different assessment technique. And one thing that was interesting to me about this is because they don't include undergraduates in this particular ranking, one of our sister UC campuses that doesn't have undergraduates, that's the University of California, San Francisco, is on this list even though it's not on the first list. So it's just an illustration, again, of some of the variability of these kinds of rankings, and it's entirely based on uh, the factors that they use to look at different campuses and institutions. Uh, they also list the rankings, this time from the Center for Measuring University Performance, um, and that particular center is one that, that has a healthy degree of skepticism about the idea of reducing institutional quality measures to one number, given the, the wide variability in terms of disciplines and size of campus and uh, the emphasis. Uh, but they, they had an interesting statement in one of the publications that I looked at that said, Nothing stirs the public imagination about higher education more than rankings unless it's football. So, <laughs> rankings are a major national sport themselves, feeding an insatiable market searching for the best universities and colleges in America, and even should they be so interested abroad. And we've certainly heard that today, and we know that there's tremendous pressure for uh, for our institutions to really try to look as good as possible in these various listings. So sometimes the, there will be um, listings that are grouped by public or private institution, and, and that's one that comes up at UCLA because, again, we, we can't necessarily compete in terms of dollars with the private institutions, but we stack up very well in terms of the publics. So it's, it is one of those other um, segmentations that happens. Uh, and of course, global rankings are increasingly important to a campus like UCLA uh, because in our current budget climate in the state of California, there is great interest in keeping tuition and fees for California students as low as possible. And uh, the Board of Regents and actually the governor and the president of the University of California have, uh, they've agreed to a deal now where basically uh, there will be a tuition freeze, tuition will remain the same for most students for the next four years. 
uh, there, as I said, there are few exceptions, but not very many. So that means if the university or any one of the campuses wants to generate additional revenue, the only way they can do that is by having students from either from out of state in the US or having students from other countries who will pay higher tuition rates. So uh, it's very important then to have the kind of reputation that spans the world to be able to attract a robust group of student applicants. And of course, one of the things UCLA says about itself is that it is the most popular college based on the fact that there are roughly 90,000 applicants for the uh, seven to 8,000 students actually admitted. So it's really hard to get into UCLA. But there are also other kinds of ratings um, that, that the campus looks at and is very proud of. So uh, the National Research Council ratings, those come out every 10 years. Those are, are things that the campus um, takes, takes very seriously. Hospital rankings, because we have a, a large medical center. And then other marks of excellence would include things like Nobel Prizes, um, other kinds of major awards that faculty get, memberships in the national academies, um, all sorts of, of different kinds of um, honors that can be recognized. Uh, but I think one thing that, that is very true in looking at the, uh, the ratings for any university is that there is tremendous variability, as we've heard, and we have to take all of those with a grain of salt and think about, okay, so how can the library help the campus appear in as positive a light as possible? So what I wanna do today is really talk about two separate initiatives at UCLA and then one situation in which the library has been very much involved in uh, creating data or setting up an infrastructure and partnerships that really help the campus maximize uh, faculty research and improve uh, teaching and uh, that help the campus be able to measure how well it's doing. So the first of these is a system known as OPUS which is called, it is UCLA's campus faculty profile system. So what does that really mean? Well, this is the online system that faculty will use to complete their performance reviews. That's kind of the hook that gets them into using the system. So again, going back to McKenzie's question this morning about how do you, how do you get faculty to cooperate in these situations when you're trying to institute a, a new way of possibly measuring output and performance. One way is to say, okay, we're gonna change the review process. We're, we're going to say we're streamlining it, we're putting it online, we're making it a lot easier for everybody involved in the process all the way along to be able to, to add materials to a file and have access to all the materials in the file. That's, that does help people buy in. Um, so the OPUS system is created um, with a number of functional components. Um, there is a common import-export interface for data integration. Then there's a faculty CV profile tool. Then in, built into this is the academic review and business workflow so that as a review goes through the various steps and goes through peer review committees and then to uh, department chairs and deans and on up, uh, that's built in. And then there's reporting and decision support. And actually those are um, pretty interesting in my mind because they're not very well defined at this point. There's, there's still considerable ambiguity about what all the reporting might be about, but more on that in a minute. 
So this page shows um, an illustration of how the system basically will work. It's pretty simple and straightforward um, with a, a profile for each faculty member and then uh, places to list teaching, places to list professional activities, and other kinds of information. Uh, and this gives you, uh, again, some idea of the kinds of information that can be included in a faculty member's profile. So they can put in employment history, they can put in um, their service, uh, they can put in scholarly and creative work, which again would be citations and uh, other kinds of works that they've done, uh, and on and on. So Opus is touted as the one place to organize your dossier. So this, I apologize for how <laughs> hard to read this slide is, but um, I'll explain it to you and, and explain uh, what the fine print says. So this is the map of data sources. Opus has been developed as a tool that will mine data from other places it exists, both on the campus, within the University of California system, and then externally. So the left hand, uh, two thirds of the image, show the variety of data sources that come from the campus. So these can range from things like um, payroll information and academic titles. Uh, some of the schools and academic divisions at UCLA have their own formats for dossiers, so those can be pulled from those sources. Student evaluations, kind of an interesting one, theoretically could be included here. Uh, and those would come from our campus learning management system, which is where the evaluations are conducted. Um, the Office of Research Administration maintains the records of grants awarded and proposals in process. Uh, and then uh, the graduate division has records that show how many students are being advised, what committees, uh, is uh, an individual faculty member participating in. External affairs is our uh, government relations and uh, fundraising arm of the campus. They really track honors and awards because that's a, they're, they're the ones who do the website overall and who have responsibility, so they very definitely want to stay on top of who's, uh, who has received what honors and distinctions. And the registrar also is one of these, and uh, the system is designed so that it can pull course load uh, information and also enrollment counts, because there's a belief that uh, if student evaluations uh, are known, and of course students do have access to what other students have thought of an individual faculty member's courses, that can influence the number of students who actually enroll in a class. So it's a way of seeing who's, uh, who's teaching classes that are filled to capacity and who's teaching classes that are really undersubscribed. Uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, in the gold box and the two um, sort of buckets right above it, uh, if you could read the fine print, you'd see that most of these are external to UCLA, but the top two, uh, one says UCLA Islandora Repository, which is the repository that the UCLA library runs, and we deposit a lot of digital library content there. And then right next to it is eScholarship, which is the University of California uh, open access repository that the California Digital Library has established and runs, and that uh, I think you'll hear more about tomorrow from Catherine Mitchell. Uh, so those are important sources of data that can populate 
the OPUS system for and a profile for an individual faculty member uh, without the faculty member having to do any of the work. And that was one of the underlying principles in developing this system was to really try to figure out how can we make this as easy as possible? Because it's going to be, uh, it's still going to be a challenge to get faculty to be sure that everything is in there, but if we can pull a lot from existing sources of data, then we can really make it a lot easier for them. So some of the other um, little buckets that are in the, uh, the gold box uh, include things like uh, getting an ORCID ID. Uh, it can pull pub from publications aggregators, and this is where um, actually there's been somewhat of a change since this map was created several years ago. So this lists Scopus, the Web of Science, and Google Scholar as just examples of three aggregators. In fact, our plan is now that the eScholarship repository has a harvesting tool and is actually um, gathering so much information about our faculty publications, our hope is that the OPUS system will not have to query these other sources themselves, but will be able to go directly to eScholarship to get the feed from there. Um, but then there are things like disciplinary article repositories. Again, um, many of these will be harvested by uh, the eScholarship repository. Uh, and then the reference management software, so Zotero, EndNote, RefWorks, uh, so this is some of the thinking that went into the, the initial design of Opus. So as you saw a couple of slides ago, Opus has really just been launched, but the planning for it started five years ago. So it's been quite a substantial undertaking, and, and there is still a lot of work to be done. So a lot of the harvesting that's described here is not yet really happening. Uh, and we're, we in the library are working closely with the OPUS staff to really put this all in place. OPUS was spearheaded by the Academic Personnel Office at UCLA, and it is, it's, while it's focused on faculty, it is um, geared for all academic employees. So eventually librarian reviews will be handled through the OPUS system as well. Um, one of the other questions that's come up with OPUS, uh, and this is on this list of um, issues that have been identified, is um, there's a lot for people who've been working for UCLA for many years, there's a lot of data about their performance that will not show up in OPUS if they don't put it in because many of these data sources don't have um, retrospective listings. So, um, so one of the issues and concerns that's been raised by some faculty members is just a, a, a concern that this presents a misleading picture of their real level of, um, of accomplishment, because many of them um, may have been at, some of them may have been at UCLA for 30 or even 40 years, and will have a very long record of, um, of teaching and doing research. So it's, you know, there, there is uncertainty about that. But to try to put all that data in would be a huge workload. So that's why the campus at this point has said, we're gonna go back to the last review and try to capture that material, but we're not going to go any farther back than that. So again, we'll see how this plays out and what the challenges are. Another issue that has come up is um, the concern about California public records laws and the fact that OPUS will have a lot of information, personal information, about individual faculty members. So um, one of the, there's a, sorry, there's a faculty member in information studies um, named Jean-Francois Blanchette, whom some of you may have heard, heard of, who 
is on the OPUS steering committee and has done a lot of work really looking at OPUS and thinking about what the issues are. And he has talked very persuasively about what might happen, what, what sort of evil uses might be made of the data that's in OPUS simply because it's, it's already aggregated, it's all there. And so if a public records request is made, it's going to be harder for the campus to say no to providing that information. So the example that's been given is, um, what if somebody uses it to find out the most highly paid faculty member who teaches the fewest courses with the worst student evaluations? <laughs> and, and, you know, that, that could happen because the, there is a lot of pressure on the University of California to be as transparent as possible. Fortunately, UCLA has uh, a privacy officer who is very highly placed in the IT organization on campus, and he's very influential, and he's also been intimately involved in the development of OPUS, and he's really advising the campus on how to think about this. But nevertheless, there are still these issues of, of data privacy that, that do conflict and create this tension with the, the move toward transparency. Uh, and then the other concern that has surfaced more than once is this, the one, the very last one, that the very nature of systematizing and recording information creates categories and names that can unintentionally influence perception or privilege certain ways of looking over others. Uh, and in this case, um, when in a, a paper that Jean-Francois wrote, he talked a lot about the difference between the disciplines and the fact that there aren't metrics that necessarily translate effectively across all disciplines. So if, if more journals, articles are found and are put into the OPUS system, that leaves out the arts faculty, the fine arts faculty, or the theater faculty who might be um, appearing in plays or other kinds of uh, performances or who might be creating art. And there's no easy way to put those into a system like Opus that, that really provides a, a level playing field. This is an issue that isn't new, it's peer review committees at the campus level have struggled with this for years. Uh, but it is something that becomes very real when we're talking about a system that's, that's as automated as OPUS is and that as automated as OPUS also wants to be. Um, and again, Jean-Francois Blanchet has a project going with one of his graduate students to figure out some metrics that can be used to measure service because we all know there are some types of service that require a huge amount of time and energy and, and ask for a major investment on someone's part. And then there are other kinds of service um, activities that take almost no time. So he's trying to figure out if there's a way to come up with a better set of metrics so that those metrics could be built into the OPUS system. So um, OPUS is, it's very new, and I think um, in a few years it will be interesting to look back and see what has happened with it, see how widely used the, the data has been, see if there have been public records requests. Um, one thing that was um, used with faculty as another selling point is that faculty could use OPUS as a tool to find other faculty members to collaborate with on campus. Well, again, that implies that they're going to have access of some sort to this system. So how much access, who determines it, what will that mean? So um, there are very significant questions about uh, data policies writ large that need to be solved. So the second 
initiative I wanted to talk about is uh, UCLA's Research Informatics Strategic Planning Initiative. This began about three years ago, and it was uh, a, it, a committee was formed, of course, being a campus. There would always be a committee. <laughs> And uh, they spent a lot of time going out and doing a lot of uh, interviewing and information gathering on the campus. And they drafted a strategic plan covering the broad area of research informatics. And uh, included in the plan were some more specific themes that the campus wanted to address. So uh, they, the report was generated about two years ago, and then for the last year, there's been a research informatics strategic planning board that meets on uh, usually a monthly or bi-monthly basis. And the focus of that board has been to develop some pilot projects to carry out that can really show how the campus could scale up in terms of support overall for, for research informatics. So a lot of this is related to the kinds of uh, data storage and management curation activities that Peter talked about earlier today and others have talked about. Um, but it, it goes beyond that to thinking about what kinds of services do faculty need in order to be able to really work effectively in this data intensive environment that we're in. So uh, the library has been very well represented on uh, the, in, throughout the RISP process. And currently on the RISP board, uh, we have uh, two members. I'm, I serve on the board, and so does Todd Grappone, who's our associate university librarian for digital initiatives and in IT. Um, so it's been very helpful. And we are scaling up a, a project to demonstrate that the library can play a central role in providing data storage and curation and also providing tools and um, referrals to people who can help faculty with things like data visualizations. Uh, so we're, we're just going to launch that this summer and we'll be uh, continuing to, to see how that unfolds. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about is this, I say, debate about a vendor research analytics product. Well, this vendor has been mentioned already today. <laughs> you can probably guess who it is. Um, it's Elsevier. Um, they came to campus and made a presentation asking UCLA to become a partner with them in developing their pure research analytics service. Um, and. The, it was an interesting meeting because it was attended not only by the senior academic administrators on the campus, including the deans, but also a number of faculty members were invited and came and were quite interested and quite skeptical. Um, in fact, totally resistant is what I would say. Um, they believe very strongly that this is UCLA information, and UCLA should not give this away to a third party to take the data, use it to create a product that then they would want to sell back to the campus. They, they don't see this as a good way to go. So uh, they've, they've really been pushing back, and at this point, uh, the campus has not done anything to try to get one of these research analytics services, although there continues to be discussion about the fact that it could be very valuable in, um, for the work of the campus, uh, particularly the deans and the vice chancellor for research. So I have a few final thoughts, um, and this is just sort of me on my soapbox. Uh, saying that um, I do think that, that what's really been important to the library at UCLA is that we have a strong track record of effective partnerships with faculty and other units on campus. We work very closely with the Center for Digital Humanities. We work very closely with our IT organizations. We work across the campus, and that has really enabled us to be at the table and 
be on people's minds when they think about some of these big issues and who needs to be engaged in helping sort them out for the campus. Um, we need to bring our library expertise to bear, and this is something we've been doing at UCLA also. Um, name disambiguation is an important one for us that uh, there, we our, our cataloging practices have emphasized objects traditionally rather than individuals and institutions, and that really needs to change. We need to think about ways that we can do a better job describing individuals and creating records, and if I had more time and if I were a cataloger, which I'm not, I could go into much more detail about this. Um, but again, I've, I've listed some of the other ways that library expertise can be helpful in this arena. I do have to ask, is there a way that the library can impact institutional rankings directly? And I ask this because when I started out as a librarian, it was always the case that in order for a campus to become an AAU member, their library had to be an ARL member. And that represented a certain level of investment in the library. And campuses were really proud of their libraries. Now, yes, that was focused on counting the, the stuff, um, but still it was recognition of the value of the library. And there's nothing in the AAU membership criteria now that is directly related to the quality of a library. And I think we as a community need to think more about what we could do to really be able to say to the campus, hey, this is something very valuable that should contribute to the institutional ranking. And then my last comment, which came um, after some of our discussion this morning, um, and it, it relates to the fact that we do have a foot in multiple camps. We're part academic, part administrative. We work well with faculty. We have contacts with students. We span the campus. Years ago, when I was at MIT, um, we had a new vice president for administration who came from Caltech. And I remember him giving a talk to all the um, middle management group there, and he told us that the greatest power that we had was the power to convene, because we could call a meeting, and people would come. We could introduce a subject and talk about it in terms of how it could affect the campus and what might be done, and we could really exercise a lot of influence in that way. So I think this is something we all need to do more of. I think we all do it to some degree, uh, but it's something that we can maximize, and it is, it is a power that we don't tend to talk about. So anyway, thank you for listening this afternoon, and um, I look forward to the rest of the presentations.